Judge Jackson, as you may know, I ask the following two preliminary questions of every nominee who appears before any of the committees on which I sit, so I will ask you these two questions first. Since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? I have not. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement related to this kind of conduct? I have not. Judge Jackson, my colleague from Missouri seems to think that it's, it's appropriate for federal judges to sentence individuals below, inappropriate, uh, to sentence individuals below the sentencing guidelines in these kinds of cases, horrific cases. And so I think it's important to offer a couple of clarifications for the record. Judge Jackson, when the U.S. Sentencing Commission first addressed the issue of sentencing in the in this area in 2012, do you remember that only 40% of convicted offenders in this category were receiving sentences within the guidelines? Senator, I don't remember exactly the number, but I do know that there was a great deal of variance from it's the guidelines. 40%. Mm. Would you be surprised to learn that the Department of Justice, which prosecutes these cases, sent a letter to the U.S. Sentencing Commission in 2013 stating that the existing sentencing guidelines for child pornography offenses do not accurately reflect the current landscape of child pornography offense conduct? Um, I don't remember that particular letter, but there was a lot of concern about this guideline from, from all sides. And now the Sentencing Commission issued another report just last year on this topic. And do you know that as of that report, an even lower percentage of convicted offenders were receiving sentences within, within the guidelines? Did you know that? I'm not surprised. It was 20% before, now it's even less. I, I didn't know, but I'm not surprised. Did you know that as of last year, it was just 30%? of non-production offenders who were sentenced within the guidelines. I did not know, but I'm not surprised. My Republican colleagues made a big show yesterday of promising a fair process. And to me, that means ensuring that you are treated no differently than any other federal judges that have got nominees that have come before us. See, there was an article recently that highlighted the fact that many of President Trump's circuit court nominees who were previously district court judges had also issued below guideline sentencing to child pornography cases. Judge Ralph Erickson, who was confirmed to the Eighth Circuit in 2017 with support from every Republican member of this committee who was serving in the Senate at the time, and there are at least 11 cases where he sentenced people to below guideline sentences. Does that surprise you? It does not, Senator. I'm not sure if you know Judge Erickson, but do you have any reason to believe he's a soft on child pornography based on these sentences? I don't have any reason to believe that. Do you, th do you think my Republican colleagues are soft on child pornography just because they voted for Judge Erickson? to become a federal appellate judge even after he issued these 11 sentences? Senator, I'm not in a position to um, evaluate whether your, your colleagues are soft on crime because of their votes. I have no reason to believe that. They voted for this person, but um, I, I think it would probably be quite unfair to characterize him as being soft on child pornography. I would also like to talk to you about jo Judge Joseph Blanco, Bianco, who was confirmed to the Second Circuit in 2019 with support from every Republican member of this committee who was serving in the Senate at the time, including Senator Hawley. In the case United States v. Bowen, Judge Bianco sentenced a defendant to 60 months in prison when his guidelines range was 151 to 188 months. And here's what Judge Bianco said in the sentencing transcript for that case. Quote, and the guidelines here, 
are just way disproportionate under the facts of this case, and I don't view them as particularly helpful in this case. I believe the probation department got it right in terms of the statutory mandatory minimum being sufficient, but not greater than necessary to achieve the factors of sentencing. Quote, I'm not sure if you know Judge Bianco, but do you have any reason to believe that he's soft on child pornography based on that sentence or those comments? I do not, Senator. Do you think my Republican colleagues, including Senator Hawley, are soft on child pornography because they voted to confirm Judge Bianco to the Second Circuit even after he, he issued below guideline sentences and made these comments? I have no reason to believe that that here are some of the other circuit judges that all of my Republican colleagues voted to confirm, despite the fact that they, uh, they sentenced child pornography defendants to below guidelines sentences. Judge Amal Thapar on the Sixth Circuit, Judge Richard Sullivan on the Second Circuit, Judge Andrew Brasher on the Eleventh Circuit, Again, I'm not sure if you've ever met these judges before, but do you have any reason to believe they don't take child pornography seriously? I do not. I would like to note that uh, Senator Cruz referred to a chart that listed eight cases and the government recommendations and the sentencing guidelines and that um, you did not adhere to those sentencing guidelines. What was not included in the chart was uh, what the probation recommendations were. And if you add those probation recommendations, in five of the eight cases, you followed the probation recommendations. In one instance, you were lower. and in one instance, you were higher than the probation recommendations. Mr. Chairman, I would like to introduce the complete chart for the record. Without objection. You've been asked to answer a lot of questions about your judicial philosophy. Some of my colleagues, particularly on the other side, seem dead set on f finding out if you are an originalist, a textualist, if you believe in a living constitution, or various other labels. I don't find these labels particularly useful. Take originalism. Proponents claim you just have to dig uh, deeply enough into the historical record and you'll somehow find the one true meaning of a constitutional provision. The fallacy of this appro approach is illustrated in District of Columbia versus Hiller. There, Justice Scalia's majority opinion and Justice Stevenson's dissenting opinion each applied originalism. Justice Stevens more effectively, in my opinion, and reached completely different conclusions about the scope of the Second Amendment. Take textualism. In Bostock, Judge Gorsuch applied textualism to find that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act protected employees from discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. In dissent, Justice Alito mocked Justice Gorsuch's application of textualism, and he wrote the following, Justice Alito. Quote, the court attempts to pass off its decision as the inevitable product of the textualist school of statutory interpretation, championed by our late colleague, Justice Scalia. But no one should be fooled. The court's opinion is like a pirate ship. It sails under a textualist flag, but what it actually represents is a theory of statutory interpretation that Justice Scalia excoriated, the theory that courts should update old statutes so that they better reflect the current values of society, end quote. And these are two justices who are usually in agreement. So, so much for labels. So instead of trying to fix some label on you, I'd rather focus on the fact that you are fair and objective in your approach, that you are even-handed in your application of law to the facts, and that you are independent. During your last confirmation hearing, you spoke about judicial independence, about what you learned during the three clerkships and your then eight years on the bench. You said, and I quote, I know very well what my obligations are, what my duties are, 
not to rule with partisan advantage in mind, not to tailor or craft my decisions in order to gain influence or anything of the sort, end quote. Well said. So my question is the following. What do you do to ensure that you maintain independence free of partisanship when you handle a case? Thank you, Senator. What I do and what I've done in all of my 570 some odd uh, opinions is to apply a methodology that is designed to ensure my impartiality and to respect the limits of my judicial role. What it means is that I am receiving the cases and at the outset, I am setting aside any personal views that I might have about the parties, about the issues. As I also said in my DC Circuit confirmation, it doesn't matter to me whether the argument is being made by the President of the United States or a death row inmate. What I'm doing is looking at the argument, I'm looking at the facts, I am applying the law in as neutral and consistent a manner as I can because that is the duty and requirement of the judicial oath. I'm also very conscious of the limits of judicial authority, of the, the restrictions that exist in the law to prevent me as a judge from becoming a policymaker. This means that I carefully scrutinize my jurisdiction. It means that I look at the text and focus on the text and the intentions of the legislatures that drafted that provision or the intentions of the framers that put forward that constitutional principle. It means I'm looking at precedent if I was fortunate enough to be confirmed to the Supreme Court, I would be upholding the principles of stare decisis as I consider the precedents and making sure that the court is putting forward consistent and um, uh, predictable rulings as is important to maintain the rule of law. All of these I see as constraints on judicial authority that I care deeply about in order to maintain my independence as is necessary to ensure public confidence in my rulings as a judge. Judge Jackson, I have sat on this committee now for a number of years. And as uh, some of my colleagues uh, continue to try to pin labels on the nominees who come before us, frankly, I find your methodology to be as succinct a uh, definition of what would lead a judge to come up with fair and objective results. I thank you for that. As a lower court judge, you were generally bound by the Supreme Court's and the DC Circuit's precedents. Uh, that certainly won't be the case if you are confirmed to the Supreme Court the Supreme Court can overturn its own precedents. That's why I found your analysis in Committee on the Judiciary versus McGann instructive. In that case, you had a precedent, Committee on the Judiciary v. Myers, that had already confronted the issues you faced. However, it was another district court decision, and you were not bound by it. You nonetheless followed that precedent. Why did you find that opinion so persuasive? Well, Senator, in um, the law, there are different kinds of precedent, and by that I mean um, there's vertical precedent, which is what people are most familiar with. There are um, cases that are handed down by higher courts, the appellate court, the Supreme Court, and those bind the lower courts so that even if you disagree with them, you have to follow them because they're binding precedent. But there's also horizontal precedent. It, it, it too is about maintaining consistency 
and predictability in the rule of law. And what that means is when you are in a district, there are many judges. And if someone else in your district has handled a case that comes out or that involves the same issues and comes out in a certain way, you as the second judge have to contend with that ruling. You can't ignore the fact that there is precedent in your district that handles a case in a particular way. And with respect to the McGann case, the precedent wasn't just close, it was nearly identical. The, the Myers case involved the former White House counsel and the argument by the executive that the former White House counsel had absolute immunity uh, in uh, with respect to a request by the legislature that she provide testimony. My case involved a former White House counsel who was claiming absolute immunity at the request of the executive in response to a legislative subpoena. In both cases, not only was the absolute immunity issue on the table, but in both cases, the same threshold issues mm -hmm. about whether or not there was jurisdiction um, in the court because the legislature had standing or didn't have standing, which, is, which was the argument that was being made. The same question about whether the court could hear a dispute between the legislature and the executive branch, all of those issues had previously been considered by my colleague in the district court. And he wrote an extensive, I'm talking about Judge Bates, he wrote an extensive opinion analyzing each of the issues. And so at a minimum, as the second judge dealing with these exact same issues, I had to look at what he did and decide. Was it persuasive? Did I agree? And I did. Judge Jackson, of course, if there had been a, a vertical precedent, i.e. from the Supreme Court or the circuit court that was on point to your McGann situation, yes, you would have had to follow that precedent, but there wasn't. And so you followed a, a, a reasoning by another district judge that made a lot of sense to me, and that certainly makes sense to me. You discussed stare decisis and the importance of precedent in your opinion, and this is what you wrote, quote, it is interesting to note that the doctrine of stare decisis performs a limiting function that reflects the foundational principles that undergird the federal government's tripartite constitutional system. This is because deciding a legal issue anew each time that same question is presented without any reference to what has been done before nudges a court outside of its established domain of saying what the law is and into the realm of legislating what the law should be. I know that you've been asked the, the questions about the importance of precedent before, but maybe you can just tell us one more time why precedent is important in our judicial system. Thank you, Senator. Our judicial system is one that is designed to uphold the rule of law. Unlike other systems in other societies, some other societies, we believe that we have a government of laws and not men, and yet there are men and women who are acting as judges in the context of our system. What precedent does is ensure that there's consistency across mm -hmm. the different individuals who are tasked with the solemn responsibility of interpreting the law. It ensures that mm -hmm. there's public confidence that the law is what is guiding judges in their decision making and not just their own individual views. And so it's, it's crucial for uh, maintaining public confidence, maintaining stability in the law, establishing a system that has predictability in it, all of which supports confidence in the judiciary, which, which is the currency of, of the judicial branch. Because of the importance of precedence in promoting confidence, et cetera, I mean, people need to know what the law is. 
And so precedent is important on this, on that score. And if you are confirmed to the Supreme Court, what factors would you consider before uh, overturning precedent? Well, there are many factors that the Supreme Court considers and not just whether they think a prior precedent is wrong. That is one of the factors. The court has said that uh, a precedent that is egregiously wrong is one that is subject to reconsideration. Uh, but in order to actually make the determination about overturning it, in addition to it being wrong, the court considers whether or not there's been reliance on that precedent, and, and if so, how much. Um, the court considers whether or not the precedent is workable. Sometimes uh, the court will issue a ruling in a case and it turns out that it's not actually functioning in the way that the court intended, and so that might be a reason uh, to revisit it. Uh, the court considers whether or not other precedents in the area have shifted such that the foundation for the particular precedent is no longer uh, uh, sustainable. And the court considers whether there are changes in the facts uh, that relate to that precedent or a, a new understanding of the facts that relate to a precedent. All of those factors are things that a court takes into, that the Supreme Court takes into account when it decides whether or not to revisit a precedent. Therefore, the court should consider all of those factors. I would say reliance factors uh, loom large, as far as I'm concerned, uh, before overturning a precedent. But basically, if you have five members of the court deciding to overturn uh, a precedent, they can do so, right? Under our scheme, yes, under the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing uh, more and more uh, presidents being uh, asked to be overturned. And analysis by National Affairs found that since 2017, when Justice Gorsuch was appointed to the court, the court has shown, and I quote, an increasing readiness to overturn precedent, end quote. This is true for both longstanding precedents and those that are just a few years old. For example, in 2018, Janus decision, the court overturned a 41-year-old precedent called Abood. That dis decision weakened public sector unions. <laughs> Justice Alito first signaled that he wanted conservative anti-union groups to challenge Abood in his 2012 decision in Knox versus SEIU. Uh, this is called signaling. And uh, Justice Alito definitely signaled his desire to revisit the Abu decision. So yes, these groups, they got the message. They brought case after case to meet the criteria that Justice Alito laid out. And although they came close in 2016, Justice Scalia's death left the court stuck in a four to four decision in a case called Fredericks v. California Teachers Association. Basically, the minute Justice Gorsuch was confirmed, the court finally had a conservative five to four majority to overturn Abood, and the result was Janus. I followed these lines of cases very closely. So that is what happened. They waited for Justice Gorsuch, and boom, five to four against unions. In, other, in another example, the courts acknowledged four most conservative justices, Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh, dissented in June Medical, voting to overturn a precedent banning burdensome and unnecessary restrictions placed on abortion providers. This particular precedent was only four years old. Now the court is poised to overturn Roe v. Wade, even though women have relied on their constitutional right to have an abortion for nearly 50 years. Of course, I'm not suggesting that Supreme, Supreme Court decision or pre precedents are sacrosanct because I'm thankful uh, the court can and uh, did revisit precedents like Plessy v. Ferguson that were wrong the day they were decided. But justices should not be seen to be advancing their individual political or ideological agendas at the expense of individual rights and precedents that people have relied on. 
One result of the court's new approach is that people's view of the court is changing for the worst. A recent Pew poll found that 44% of Americans now disapprove of the Supreme Court. This is up 15 points from August 2020, shortly before the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died and Amy Comey Barrett was appointed to fill her seat. I think court watchers acknowledge there is an ideologically, ideological split in this current Supreme Court when we are seeing more cases decided on ideological bases, not on the facts and the law. I think it leads to the American people questioning whether the court is a fair and objective arbiter of cases in controversy. You were asked earlier today about your representation of uh, Guantanamo de detainees. Just to make it clear, as a federal public defender, you were assigned to represent Guantanamo detainees. Is that right? That is correct, Senator. And then while at Morrison and Forrester, you also did pro bono work for Guantanamo, Guantanamo detainees. Were you assigned to do that work as well? So there was one detainee who I had represented as a federal public defender mm -hmm. who was brought into my firm's practice, mm -hmm. unbeknownst to me, uh, and when I arrived at the firm, the attorneys who were working on that case recognized that I had previously been a lawyer who had represented this particular detainee and asked if I would help with his habeas petition at that stage. I think you clarified that earlier today. And you served as counsel of record on amicus briefs related to detention. I think that was brought out today. Yes. Uh, were you working on behalf of detainees at that point or were you working on behalf of other groups or individuals? I was working on behalf of other groups or individuals in, in, with respect were they to retired judges. Um, I, yes, there were, there were three briefs in total, two different cases. And, um, one of the briefs that I filed was on behalf of 20 retired federal judges, including one who was a partner at my firm at the time, uh, and who wanted to make a particular argument to the court concerning the detention process. And these were judges that were nominated by various presidents, so it must have been a diverse group, and they asked you to do the brief. And they did, yes. So as part of your work at the law firm, a responsibility of your employment, you were um, assigned to work with this diverse group of retired judges and to represent conservative or libertarian organizations such as the Cato Institute and the Rutherford Institute to advocate their views. Yes, the other um, two briefs that I filed were at the cert stage and then at the merit stage of a case that was eventually uh, mooted. But my clients in those cases were a diverse group of organizations, including the Cato Institute, the Rutherford Institute, and the Constitution Project. Uh, members of this committee know full well that uh, uh, <laughs> Lawyers are, we, we are, um, we have to follow the codes of professional conduct, which says that we have to zealously represent our clients, and that's what you are doing with regard to the detainees. And I would just want to note that some of the very senators who are openly questioning you for representing uh, defendants or detainees have in the past made the argument that judicial nominees should not be opposed for the arguments they make in the course of representing clients. I'm going to quote one of my colleagues. I've been a military lawyer for almost 30 years. I represented people as a defense attorney in the military that were charged with some pretty horrific acts, and I gave them my all. The system of justice that we're so proud of in America requires the unpopular to have an adequate and an advocate. And every time a defense lawyer fights to make the government do their job, that defense lawyer has made us all safer. Do you agree with that? Uh, I do, Senator. 
In 2012, prominent conservative lawyers signed a letter defending attorneys who have represented Guantanamo de detainees. In part, the letter said, quote, the American tradition of zealous representation of unpopular clients is at least as old as John Adams's representation of the British soldiers charged in the Boston Massacre. Good defense counsels is key to ensuring that military commissions, federal juries, and federal judges have access to the best arguments and most rigorous factual presentation before making crucial decisions that affect both national security and paramount liberty interests, end quote. So the, the quote that I read isn't the first time that to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have um, tried to say that your representation and your work as a public defender somehow, I don't know, disqualifies you or makes you um, leaning one way or the other. So you've made it very clear that that is not what you are about. I just have one more question in the remaining time. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm over. Senator, I'm sorry. We're on a roll call. I'm on such a roll. <laughs> on, you're on a roll and we're on a roll yes, call. Yes, thank you. I apologize. 